Uh, I want to ask you a question. How many of you know a prepper? I want to see hands. Does anybody know a prepper? You know what a prepper is? Okay. Does anybody live with a prepper? All right. Okay. Serious question. Is anybody in here a prepper? All right. I got a lot of you. Okay. So for those of you who don't know, a prepper, are they, these are the people who buy all the toilet paper out when things come around, right? <laughs> these are the people who are at Sam's and Walmart, and they go to every single place, and they buy as much toilet paper as they can, because the one thing you don't want to not have in the apocalypse is toilet paper. <laughs> Amen? But no, preppers are these people, they, they, they are the people who stockpile food, they stockpile supplies, guns and ammunition, you kind of name it. Anything that you would need to live without the normal trappings of an ordered society. Uh, these are the types of people that if given the chance, they would probably build a bunker under their house, right? They would put, and they would stock it, sorry, go back, uh, they would stock it with toilet paper and with food, right? Now, they do this for a reason. They do this because they have a vision of the future. They have this future foresight of a society without order, a society where money becomes valueless, where law disappears, where every person and every family is really for themselves. And so a prepper's work is based on a vision of, a vision of the future that's bleak, uh, that's ugly, that's dark. Uh, but, but the point is, and it could, like, if you're a prepper, good for you. Like, good, like, I'm... I'm, I'm well, good. Okay. Yeah. I love it because my mother-in-law, she has gotten into the prepping stuff. Like she orders food now for us. And I shouldn't tell you this because you're going to come to my house, but I also have guns, right? Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, come on. I have, uh, so, um, but no, so yeah, it's funny. I've gotten into the, I've, I've watched the prepper lifestyle very closely, but I have not got into it. Right. But the point of this is that a, that a, a prepper's lifestyle is predicated on a future orientation, on a future vision. And I would tell you that while preppers aren't the only ones who do this, right? People who have a vision for the future tend to alter their present to account for that future. So you think about a couple who's expecting a baby. And what do they do when they know the baby's coming? They begin to nest. They go out and they buy the crib. They put it together. They buy all the trappings. They buy the pacifiers. They get ready. They, as my wife put it when we were having our babies, they, they nest. They make their houses into nests. Students, you have a vision for the future, don't you? I'm sure some of you have in your mind a picture of what you want to do in the future. I remember growing up knowing nothing, and I mean nothing, except for that I was going to work at NASA. I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be anything. I wanted to be either an astronaut or a flight controller at Johnson Space Center. And so I spent my entire childhood thinking this was going to be the case. I studied human space flight. You can see, this is me. This is tiny little Josh Connor with his dad. I was probably four years old. Made them take me to Kennedy Space Center so I could watch a rocket launch, right? And of course, I was shy back then, just like I am today, so you can see me rubbing my eye. But, but this is me as a tiny child, right? I committed myself to studying human space flight. I memorized the code books that would launch the space shuttle. In my, this was actually me at, a, at Space Center Houston in one of the trainers. Uh, but I, I would sit in my house, and I had a, my dad had one of those old radios with the flick buttons, Mark, kind of like you have in your house, right? And I would sit there and lay on my back and put my feet on top of that and pretend like those were the controls to the space shuttle. And, you know, I knew it all. I knew the planets, their orientations. I could, I could maneuver the, the MMU like nobody else. You take me to the Space Center Houston back in the day, you strap me into that thing, I could fix the satellite faster than anybody there. Put an astronaut in that thing, I could have done it better, right? <laughs> I mean, I knew it all. This was my jam. It was what I was all about. Of course, I got to college and realized that when you get science at a higher level, it's all math, and I ain't no good at the math. So the Lord had other plans for me, and he directed me away from that. But that was my life as a child. <laughs> like, I loved space, right? I thought it was everything. As Christians, we have a guaranteed future. Right? Our hope is in a resurrected living Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. By his sacrifice in the great mercy of God, we have been born again to a living hope. We've been born again to an eternal inheritance that is secured and defended and kept for us by God himself. And it's that future that changes everything about the way we live today. So I would ask the question, though, does, does, does how we live as Christians matter? Does it really matter if we know the future is true, if we know that we have this inheritance, if we have this faith? After all, as I've heard people say, we're saved by grace through faith, so can't we do whatever we want? 
I mean, if there's no need to merit salvation, if there's no need to achieve it, why does it matter if I choose how I want to live in this life? Because at the end of the day, I'm going to get this promise, right? Well, the biblical answer to this question of does it matter how we live is yes, because God. Because God has saved us, because God has redeemed us by virtue of His own power, by, by virtue of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, because God, therefore, we live differently. Christianity is a because, therefore, faith. What God has done for us in Christ is always the basis and the motivation for how we are to govern our thinking, our speaking, and our actions in this life. Now, I want to show you this right here from what we've been studying in Peter, because this is a biblical truth. It comes all throughout Scripture that we are a because, therefore, faith. But thus far in our study of Peter, we have looked at 12, well, we looked at 13 verses, but, but really verses 3 through 12, what we have seen is that there is not one single command. Now, does that show up at all? Okay. It's not super clear to you, and you don't have to see the words, but do you see any red on that screen? Does anybody see red? Okay. I've marked it so that all the verbs that are imperative verbs are blue, all the participles are purple, and all the commands are red. There are no red ones up there, are there? It all looks purple. Good. Okay, that's, that's fine. As long as you don't see red, that's what I'm getting at, right? What I'm trying to show you here from a visual standpoint is that there has been no do this, do that. There's been no live this way. There's no ship up or shape out. So far in the first 12 verses of 1 Peter, all Peter has been trying to communicate is that we live out of an abundance out of an abundance of God's great mercy. All he's been trying to do so far is comfort his readers to encourage them that in their time of exile, God is for them. That's all he's trying to do. And over the past several weeks, that's what we've looked at. Verses 3 through 5 remind us of our status as children with a living hope and an eternal inheritance in our resurrected Savior. Verses 6 through 9 reminds us that we can have joy and confidence in our future glory even though we may suffer now. And verses 10 through 12 remind us that the salvation that is coming is actually anchored in the ancient past when the Old Testament prophets prophesied and predicted Jesus the Messiah coming into this world, suffering and being glorified. But again, in none of these are there any commands to do. There's no pointing in a direction saying you must do this. The only thing you have to do in verses 1 through 12 is bask in the wonders of what God has accomplished for us and to us in Jesus Christ. But a change occurs, and it starts in verse 13. Here we see Peter shift from telling us what God has done for us, what he has made us into because of the gospel, to how we are supposed to live our lives in response to that truth. The indication of this comes in the sudden appearance of a bunch of imperatives. So, uh, this is, again, the color's not good, but you can see here there's orangish red here, there's orangish red here, and there's orangish red here, set among all the purples and the blues, or the blues or the purples, right? depending on what you see up there. And so the key transition here is actually marked with that word at the very top, therefore. You see therefore? Again, when you ask the word, you see the word therefore, what are you supposed to do? Uh, what's it there for, exactly? Therefore is always an indicator that what has come before is the basis, grounds, or motivation for what will follow. And here, Peter is communicating this, and here's kind of the main idea for the day. Because we have a guaranteed future hope, therefore we are to adopt a lifestyle fitting to that future. Because we have a guaranteed future hope, therefore we are to adopt a lifestyle fitting to that future. And so in this phrase, because we have a guaranteed hope, that's in verses 3 through 12, therefore we are to adopt a lifestyle fitting to that future is really verses 13 through 21. Actually, it really goes through all the way through chapter 2, verse 3. And those, that's what we're going to look at over the next few weeks. So I had planned to go through verse 21 today, but as I was writing my manuscript, my time clock kept ticking up and up and up and up. And I was like, I need to break this into two sermons. And so this week we're going to look at verses 13 through 16 and look through the first two imperatives. Next week we'll pick up and look at verses 17 through chapter 2, verse 3, and we'll look at the last three. But I want to ask you now, if you will, to stand up in honor of reading God's Word if you're physically able. And if you haven't already, we're going to be in 1 Peter, which is towards the end of your Bible if you're using a physical Bible. Uh, it's towards the end of the list on your phones. 1 Peter chapter 1. 
verses 13 through 16. And so here it is. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Father, as we look to your word today, would we just remember that everything that I say, that your word speaks to us, comes not in a void, but comes fully out of the goodness that you have shown us in the gospel. That in your great mercy, you have caused us to be born again. Therefore, we are to change the way we live, to model, to mirror Jesus, as Judd reminded us several times today, that we are to be conformed into his image. Father, would you not only bless us with the reminder to do this, but would you empower us to do it today? We pray all these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. You can sit down. So as I just mentioned, therefore really is the key transition in the flow of Peter's message throughout the whole book of 1 Peter. For the whole rest of the book, he's going to really come back and draw on the ideas that he communicated in verses 3 through 12, which is the gospel and its impact on us in a nutshell. So we're to remember everything we talk about, really from now to the end of our study, connects to that theological foundation in verses 3 through 12. They serve really as the pillar that holds up everything is to come. And I would say, remember this well. Remember this very well. The Christian life is always rooted in the theological truth of the gospel. Biblical commands never, ever, ever come out of the void of nothingness. They're not just random. God never compels us to obey just because. There's always a reason. There's always a rationale to why he tells us to do the things that he tells us to do. This goes all the way back to the Old Testament, to the Ten Commandments. I think often we think the Ten Commandments just kind of fluttered down out of heaven on the tablets. And and in a sense, God did write them on the tablets. But they're not disconnected from what God had already done to Israel. Law did not come until after salvation was accomplished. Did you know that? So if you look at the uh, Exodus chapter 20, which is where we see the Ten Commandments come, look where it begins. And God spoke all these words saying, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And so what's he saying here? To start off the Ten Commandments, he is saying, and God spoke all these words, and then here's how I would paraphrase this. Because I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, so I saved you because I saved you, Israel, therefore you shall have no other gods before me. Do you see the difference that makes? God just doesn't come out and arbitrarily say, hey, no other gods before me. He goes, look, I have redeemed you, I have saved you, by by my own power I have brought you out of Egypt, and I have made you my special people. Because of that, therefore, don't have any other gods before me. Don't prioritize the gods of the world before me. Do you see the difference between an arbitrary command to do and a rational reason why we should do it? I think this is important because this is something that's true of us all the time. We are people who are empowered to do by the gospel. We don't do to achieve, we do because. Does that make sense? This is critical to know. And so then what does a lifestyle befitting the wonders of grace look like? What is this, because of the grace we've received, what is our lifestyle supposed to look like? And I would say the first command that comes is actually here towards the end of verse 13. Uh, If you look at it, it says summary command for what is to come. And this is going to encompass all the other things that follow. So of all five imperatives we're going to see in verses uh, 13 through chapter 2, verse 3, this kind of summarizes them all, and it is this. We are to set our hope fully on future salvation. We are to be totally committed to our future destiny with Christ. Verse 13 says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action... And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, you might ask me, and I might tell you, how did you see that the first command comes, it set your hope fully on the grace that will be revealed to you or be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ? 
I'm glad you asked, right? Because all of those look like commands. Preparing your minds for action seems like a command to me. Being sober-minded seems like a command to me. Set your hope seems like a command to me. But here's where the Bible student who's looking very closely, and again, this was not something I would have noticed the first time I studied it or the fifth time I've studied it, but this time around I picked up on it, right? If you look here, preparing has what on it? An I-N-G, right? And being, sober-minded, has an I-N-G. Anytime you see words like that, they typically are supportive of something else. They're called participles, right? Here's a grammar lesson for the day, okay? So we see here that the command comes here, set your hope. That's the command, and these two things, to prepare your mind and to be sober-minded, support that. They tell us how we are to set our hope fully. And so that's the way we're going to break this text down. The main idea, the main assertion, is the call to total commitment. Set your hope fully on the grace of God being brought to you. And how do you do that? You do that by preparing your mind for action, by being ready, and you do it by being sober-minded, by being focused. So let's look at the main idea first, setting our minds fully on the hope that's to be revealed to us. This command, this idea of setting your hope fully, is a call to consecration. Consecration is just a fancy word for total dedication, total commitment, to be determined towards something. The determination that we have then is to be set on a specific object. And that object is the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so what is that, you might ask, because that's kind of an interesting way to say this. But, but all Peter's trying to say here is that we're to set our minds fully on the fullness of salvation that will come to us when Jesus returns. Biblically, the idea of, of salvation occurs in three phases. Right? We, in, in kind of the modern evangelical world, like to use the word salvation just to refer to, hey, I got saved at a certain point. Right? I, I got trusted in Jesus at a certain point in my life. I, I confessed him as Lord. I believed in my heart that God raised him from the dead. That's when I was saved. Right? For most of us, we probably use that word as a past tense idea. I was saved. Right? Or I am saved. Sometimes we use it in the present. But biblically, as we look at the idea of salvation... It occurs in three phases, past, present, and future. So we look here, the first one is justification. The first idea, the past idea, if you will, is to be justified. Now justification is just a fancy legal word that says your punishment has been received by someone else and you have been declared innocent. And when it comes to the gospel, what does the gospel teach us? How are we justified? Jesus Christ himself walked into our place, into our punishment. He received what we deserved, and in response, we were declared innocent. God dropped the gavel and said, you no longer have any crimes charged to your account. You are free and clear. Go out and be at peace. And, and what I love about justification, if I can take just a second to continue to flesh this out, I think we stop too soon sometimes when we talk about justification. We stop at being innocent. Like, it's great to be in the courtroom, the cosmic courtroom, and God the judge says, guess what, Josh? There is now nothing on your record. You are free and clear. I don't even see it. It's been expunged. It's gone. It's cast as far as from the east from the west. I'll never remember it. I'll never hold it against you. You're good. Go. That's awesome, isn't it? That's good. That's forgiveness. Pure, total, simple forgiveness in the gospel. But justification actually gives us a little bit more than that. It doesn't just say, hey, the, the, the gavel is dropped, you're innocent. But guess what? All the good that Jesus did, all the credits that were in his account get transferred to your account. You don't walk out of the courtroom at zero. You walk out of the courtroom with all the righteousness, all the good works, all the value that Jesus Christ had because that's what justification does. It says, yes, innocent, but also granted the fullness of God in you. And that's a good thing. That's like saying, hey, not only are all your debts forgiven you, but here's the credit card to the, the U.S. Treasury, right? Which is probably a terrible idea because we're in debt. But like, here's, 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 the, here's the card that has unlimited funds for it. It's yours too. And guess what you did for that? Nothing. The Lord in His grace said, yes, you're innocent, and also, yes, you have all of the righteousness of Christ at your disposal. That's great news. That's the good news of the gospel, but it goes beyond that to the present. We like to use the fancy word sanctification for this. So to be saved is to be justified, but to be saved is also to be sanctified. This is the experiential side of salvation, right? 
The first, justification is a legal idea. Sanctification is an experiential idea. And that's where we all find ourselves. If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, if you have been justified by placing your faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you're on this side of eternity with us, then you are experiencing the process of sanctification. And this is the process or the experience of becoming more and more like Jesus. It's, it's pursuing Him. It's learning how to live like Him. It's gaining more and more of the holiness that He gives to us. Right? It's using that card that has His unlimited righteousness on it and swiping it so that it becomes more and more true of our life. And then finally, we look to the future in, in salvation, the biblical idea of it. So to be saved is to be glorified. Glorification is the fulfillment side of salvation. This is really the final and eternal phase, and this is what Peter is always talking about. In 1 Peter specifically, when Peter uses the word salvation, he is always looking to the end of the end, right? to this time when we are glorified. And final salvation won't be realized until the return of the king. Then and only then we will experience the final salvation, which as Judd mentioned earlier, is this resurrection of our bodies and the recreation of the world as we know it into something that it was always supposed to be. A world without sin's taint. A world just perfectly made for us. And so Peter, what he's getting at here, and what he's going to say over and over and over in various different ways through this epistle, is this. People who set their minds fully on the world to come will have the most impact on the world today. People who set their minds most fully on the world to come will have the most impact on the world today today. And I think we see that all the time, but it's specifically true here in 1 Peter. That's really his whole message, is, is you're going to suffer and then you're going to get glory, so live today for that future and change today. Right? So to be setting our minds fully on the hope that is to come to us is really to go all out for Christ. He has made our future sure and certain. We, we are a determined people because we know what's coming. In a real way, we are to live our lives borrowing from the certainty of our inheritance. So if you knew, if you knew with a hundred percent certainty, like there was no doubt, you saw the account, you saw the paperwork, you saw all the stuff was in order and you knew things were good, and somebody came to you and said, hey, on January 1st of 2025, you would have a billion dollars transferred from this account into your account, how would you live today? you'd probably change the way you live. And hopefully you'd be smart about it, right? You wouldn't go spend all of it before it's yours, but you may change the way you live your life based on the, the outlook that you have. Oh my goodness, I'm going to be able to pay off my house one just a couple months from now, right? Oh, I can do this, I can do that. So let's not pretend like we're going to run into debt to, to pay it off later, but let's think about how it would change us today. As Christians, we're commanded to think this way. We have a future life guaranteed. We have an account that is filled with unlimited funds, and we will have access to it, and we are to called to start living now with the certainty that it will come to fruition. The paperwork has been laid out. It's all signed. It's all ready. We don't know the date necessarily, but it is coming. Right? And so how do, we, how do we set our minds fully on this? How do we live in a way where we're a determined people? Well, as I showed you, these two verbs help us to see it. And maybe the way I would paraphrase this or rephrase this text is this way. Therefore, based on all that's come in verses 3 through 12, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ by first preparing your minds for action and by being sober-minded. So here we go. Let's look into these. Okay, First, to, be, to set your mind fully on the hope that will come to you at the revelation of Christ, you must be ready. You have to be ready. Right? Therefore, preparing your minds for action. Now, this is a fun phrase because this is actually, in your Bibles, in your English Bibles, this is a fully interpreted phrase of a very common Greek and Hebrew idiom. Idiom is just a cultural way of saying something, right? Uh, so, so the actual text behind this, and I bet you... Five dollars that your Bible probably has a footnote in it that says something along this phase. Actual text says, girding up the loins of your mind, right? Girding up the loins of your mind. Yeah, Sherry, right? That's silly, isn't it? Uh, for a junior high student to read this, they would probably start giggling, yes? Uh, you know? 
Uh, gird up the loins of your mind. What's he talking about here? And that's why we change it to preparing your minds for action. But, but in ancient times, this was a colloquial way of saying, get ready to move. Right? Imagine that back in the ancient days, you were wearing a robe that went down your ankles. It would be really hard to get ready to fight or to get ready to run and move quickly if you have cloth down around your ankles, right? Imagine wearing your, your maxi dress, ladies, and having to get ready to, to do battle or to run a marathon. It's probably not going to be a good idea, right? And so what do you do? What did an ancient person do? Well, they would go, gird up their loins, and that means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hike up my robe, and I'm going to tuck it in here under my belt so that, you know, I got some movement room down here, okay? So I can get ready to fight, so I can get ready to roll, so I can get ready to do what I need to do. Now I've got to fix this because I messed it up, right? Ugh. Can't show any skin, yeah? Do what? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. I'm, I've girded up my loins, yes? So you tuck your robe up, you'd, you'd get your mind ready for movement, you'd get, your, you'd get ready to act. Or, or in the words of Michael Buffer, for those of you who don't know who that is, he's, he's a professional boxing announcer who was the one who really coined the phrase, let's get ready to rumble! So if there was the Josh Connor paraphrase of 1 Peter 1.13, I would say, therefore, let's get ready to rumble! And be sober-minded and set your hope fully on the grace that is to be, right? Yeah, yeah. But that's really what this is saying, right? When Peter tells us to gird up the loins of our mind, he's telling us to prepare our minds for action. And I think it's important to note here that the place of preparation, what's supposed to be ready for action, is not our physical bodies, is it? He says, no, the place you're supposed to be prepared for action is your mind. And church, this is a hard one for us. Hope requires disciplined thinking. To be disciplined in thought means that we are always filling our minds with the things of God in such a way that they fuel our decision-making process. You want to have enough in your mind of the things of God, of the Word of God, of the wisdom of God, so that when you hit an, a circumstance or a situation in life, you're ready to address it right then and there. That's what you want. But but. We typically don't do that, right? And there's a variety of reasons why, but, but we have to go about that through serious study of God's Word. And I would tell you that this is not just reading the Bible, but also thinking about it. I had a seminary professor who always used to tell the story of one of the guys he ran into one day. He was in the library, and he said he had a stack of books open, and he was just he was looking through them, and, 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 and he had put his head down for a minute, and the professor came up to him and said, you know, you know what have you been studying? He goes, prof, I can't remember. I don't remember any of it. I, I just, I, it goes in my one ear and out the other. I can't stop. And prof goes, well, how much time have you been reading? He goes, I've been here for four hours, and I've been reading the whole time. And prof said, that's your problem. He goes, if you have four hours to study, spend an hour reading and three hours reflecting. And then you won't forget what you're reading. And I think that that's an illustration of probably most of us in this room. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb and use myself as probably the litmus test, right? And I have it, I think, a little bit better than you because you guys, by your grace and generosity towards the church, I get to do this for a living, right? But if I was putting myself in your shoes and I'm not getting paid to do this, you probably don't have a lot of time to seriously study the Bible. I get that, right? I'm with you. And so we may have a few minutes to read our Bibles in the mornings and we rush through our three chapters just to get the check mark done and then we move on. And we don't think about it at all. We don't move on it at all. We don't reflect on it at all. We don't act on it at all. And so my, my, my encouragement to you, church, is read less, think more. I know that might be counterintuitive, but that's what I would challenge you to do. Read less, think more. Because you will get so much more out of the Christian life if you just read one paragraph and then mull on it for a while than if you read one book but you don't think about it again. So if you're in a reading plan and you can't keep up with it or all you're getting through is the time that you take to read, shrink that reading plan back. Look at me. It's okay if you don't get through the Bible in a year. It's okay if your reading plan says you missed a day because you decided to spend more time on one than the other. I want to encourage you, study the Bible seriously because it's through this that we gain the ability to be disciplined in our thought. It's through this that we are ready for things. And come to the Word and ask the questions, what does this teach me about God? What does this paragraph teach me about who God is? What does this paragraph teach me about who I am? 
How does this paragraph now fit with that paragraph? How does this chapter fit with that chapter? How does it inform the way I live? What I try to do for you every Sunday is, is, is do the, the hard work of connecting the dots for you. I fill it in with a lot, hopefully, of other things about exhortations to do things, illustrations to highlight things, but, but my hope is to show you that you can look at the Bible and you can see these things too. Right? That's why I showed you the two INGs versus the command, because I want you to be able to do that. And now that you know to look for those things, next time you sit down, you might actually be able to do it. That's, that's my hope for us, is that we'll take Bible study seriously. Discipline thinking allows us to be able to take on whatever life brings our way. And it shows us, I think, that how we are to address any and every situation that we face in a way that keeps our minds fully set on the grace of God that is being brought to us. Right? If, if you know what God's Word says, then you can react and respond with eyes on the future in any situation. And that's really the hope that we have. But keeping our eyes and minds on the prize is not just about being ready, is it? It's also about being focused on the future. So we see that 1 Peter 1.13 says this, preparing your minds for actions and being sober-minded. To be sober-minded is to be in control of your own thought process. More than just being rational, it's about being self-controlled. A sober-minded Christian is one who stays focused on the future throughout all circumstances and situations and yet this i would say is another huge battle not just for our age but throughout the ages for christians you see we people by nature by human nature are easily lulled by the things of this word a world aren't we word right my arkansas came out Ooh, yeah. we, and we shouldn't be deceived there are a lot of people who say that you know the world is evil, the world is wicked, and, and, and there's some truth to that, but the reality is also that the world has a lot of really good things in it, doesn't it? God made good things. Hey, let me ask you a question. Is your family a good thing? Right? Are, are your friends a good thing? Are your material possessions a good thing? I think so. Are your careers and, and your successful careers, are they good things? Right? All of these are good things that God has made and God has given but they are not the greatest thing. And the reality is that too often these good things become idols in our minds because we let them replace the greatest thing, which is the Lord Jesus Christ and the culmination of our salvation when he comes back to end all things. Tim Keller, who I've been reading a lot of lately, he's just I read a book about him and now I'm reading everything he's written. Speaking of idols, he says in his book, Counterfeit Gods, which I would highly recommend, he says this, we think that idols are bad things, but that is almost never the case. The greater the good, the more likely we are to expect that it can satisfy our deepest needs and hopes. Amen? Right? Anything can serve as a counterfeit God, especially the very best things in life. And that's why we see, especially in our society, what are the idols that we have? Family, career, success, reputation, those are good things that we say, no, those are the things that can satisfy my deepest needs and hopes. And what does that do that draws our focus from up above to where Christ is seated to what? Here. Because I'm the idol, ultimately. Me. It's about me, it's about me, it's about me. Right? So to be focused, to be sober-minded means keeping the main thing the main thing. And that's a battle. When we keep our focus clearly on Christ and on his gospel, then we are able to see clearly how lesser and yet still good and wonderful things of this world showcase God's mercy, his goodness, and his glory. Because when you remember in your successful career that it wasn't you who ultimately achieved that, but God who achieved that in and through you, then you recognize the source of it and he gets the glory, not you. When you see your beautiful family around you, despite the craziness that they probably are, and you go, look what I've done. I've succeeded, right? You make that an idol. But when you say, no, look how good God has been to me. I have a family. These, these things all work to showcase the glory and goodness and mercy of God. So how do, we be, how do we be focused people? 
Well, I think the first thing that you have to do in light of what I've just said about idols in our lives and the good things is, is root out the idols of good that prevent you from focusing what is, the, on what is great. Go and ask yourself the question, what really gives me satisfaction in this life? What really am I seeking to, to be satisfied by? Is it, is it by my career? Is it by my family? Is it by this thing? Is it by that thing? Ask yourself the hard questions because, again, this goes back to being ready. You have to think about it. You have to take the time to reflect on your heart. And maybe the reason we don't want to do that also is because we don't want to see what's in there. But, but here's the truth. When you start digging, guess who's in there, Christian? The Lord, right? You're looking at the outer shell, which is probably dirty, but inside, the Lord dwells, and He is ready to break that heart open for you. And I would say the second thing that we do to be application, or the second application of being focused what, the number one thing that you can positively do to stay focused on the future is this, what you're doing right now. Meeting with the saints, gathering with the people of God, spending time with the people of God. The author of Hebrews finds this so important that he says this in Hebrews 10, 24-25. He says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, and I would put in the parentheses, those who are not future-focused and who don't want to be reminded of the future, but encouraging one another. And look here, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In other words, we don't neglect to meet together because what's tomorrow? The return of Christ. And if it's not tomorrow, then we meet together because what's the day after that? It could be the return of Christ. And what's the next day? It could be, it could be, it could be. And so we gather every seventh day, or every first day technically in the morning, for what purpose? To remind ourselves to stay focused on the future. That's my number one job as Harold, is just to stand up here and go, look to Jesus. What's, what's your role today and what's your role this week? Look to Jesus. Like I get to do a lot more teaching than that, but my ultimate role is simply to go, hey, this week has probably distracted you. The world has probably surrounded you and pulled your eyes down. Let me take a moment to lift your chin up and look to him who is seated at the right hand of God because he is the one who needs to keep our focus on. That's all my job is. To which you may say, could you just say that and we can go to lunch early? I go like, no, I'm going to teach a little bit, okay? I like to do this. This is, this is fun for me, right? So that's, that's the way that we are to begin to change our lifestyle, to be totally committed to this God, to be totally committed to the guaranteed future that he has promised us. And I am out of time for the day. So next week, we're going to look at the next four imperatives, right? We're going to look at what it looks like to a lifestyle of purity, a lifestyle of loving one another, and a lifestyle of transformation. That's what we're going to look at next week uh, as we continue through the text of 1 Peter. Uh, but let me pray for us now. Father, we thank you so much for the grace that you have shown to us. Lord, not only is it to our benefit, not only is it to our blessing, but Lord, it is also what empowers us to live differently. And so, Lord, as we consider 1 Peter, as we consider Peter's message to the church, I pray that we would just see that because of all that you have given us in the gospel, because you have given us everything in the gospel, that first and foremost, above all, you call us to be totally committed to you, that you call us to set our hope fully on salvation that is coming. So, Lord, I pray that we would be a church who lives like that, that we would let our vision of the future, our hope for the future, be so clear, so bright, so wonderful, so compelling that it, we change the present because of it. Lord, it is churches like this, churches that think future, that have an impact on today. And, Lord, I don't know about the people in our congregation, but that's what I want. Lord, whether we grow or not, I just want our church to be a church that makes an impact on this world. And that begins with having a vision of the future that is bright and wonderful and beautiful. So would you grant that to us today? I pray these things for Jesus' sake. Amen.